Are there hidden codes in the biblical text? A question that a lot of people are asking today. Many competent Bible teachers are writing books excited about the codes. Grant Jeffrey probably leads the pack and does an excellent job highlighting the positive side of all of this. We'll cover some of that. There are others that are very well-known, competent apologists who feel that the codes are very dangerous, that this is a lot of nonsense. This is not a recent phenomenon, by the way. The Kabbalists, the various uh, venerated rabbis of the past, have uh, felt from the beginning that the Torah is not only describes the creation, but was the very template that God used to do the creation. They've had a very, very high and mystical view of the text from the beginning. But even in the 16th century, Rabbi Moses uh, Kodavaro made the remark, the secrets of the Torah are revealed in the skipping of letters. You'll find these kinds of quotes in a lot of the ancient Jewish literature. The Kabbalists, and that word means many different things to many different people. The Kabbalah is a form of Jewish mysticism that's occultic. But the term actually means received lore and is used several different ways. The Talmud uses it in the sense of oral traditions and lore passed on verbally. The term also can, refers to the writing of authority to give a, a rabbi the authority to conduct certain kinds of kosher practices. The term has many different meanings. It generally refers to the ancient scribes and some of the beliefs and views they held about the text. Much, Many of their views were kept in secret because they were going through such severe persecution. As the centuries go by, one of the most uh, fruitful times in Jewish literature was in the 12th and 13th and 14th centuries in Spain, many places, but in Spain particularly. As you recall, it was in October of uh, 1492 that any Jew left in Spain would be killed. That's why Columbus and his crew boarded before midnight of that deadline his vessels that head to the New World. There's a whole thing there you might find interesting to look into. But the point is, much of what the ancient rabbis learned were kept secret or encrypted or hidden. And the burden of current rabbis in Judaism is to try to rediscover what they believe those guys used to know. And uh, so that's why some of these quotes are so highly venerated in Judaism today. There was a guy by the name of Weissmandel about the time of the First World War. Well, at the age of 13, he was able to get his hands on some of the, a few of the ancient books by some of the ancient rabbis. He became fascinated with the Torah. And he was in the habit of copying them down, uh, ten letters across on cards, in a, a standard practice in cryptography. And he started to study deeply the uh, text itself in a cryptographic sense, what we and I would call a cryptographic sense. And he made a number of interesting discoveries. Let me just share one of them, and this goes back to the period between World War I and World War II. Uh, Weissmandel, by the way, was on a train to Auschwitz and um, was able to escape, and he spent his life trying to do just the same kind of thing that Schindler did, trying to buy freedom for Jews, and he was obviously absorbed with that. But he also uh, did make some discoveries. Now, the word Torah which is the law, in Hebrew is spelled with four letters. Now remember that Hebrew goes from right to left. All languages go towards Jerusalem. Did you know that? English, German, French, Spanish, Latin, everything west of Jerusalem goes from left to right. Languages that are east of Jerusalem, Hebrew, Aramaic, Sanskrit, Chinese, whatever, go from right to left. They all go towards Jerusalem. I, think it's, I don't know what you do with that piece of information. But I just thought I'd mention it. But when we we're talking Hebrew, we're going from right to left. You got used to that. The word Torah in Hebrew is in four four letters: a tau, a vav, a resh, and a he. I have transliterated it for us so we get comfortable with it our, to our Western way of thinking. Uh, T O R H is a, is a, is a way of sort of transliterating the word Torah. What's interesting, if you go to the Book of Genesis, Bereshit bara Elohim, if you go to the first tau or T, in effect, and you count 49 letters, take the next one, an interval of 49 letters, the next one is a Vav, okay, which is sort of like an O, and then you count another 49 letters, you come to a Resh, and another 49 letters, and you come to a He. So here's the name Torah, spelled out 
in what you would con could consider a Cardano grill of 49 letter intervals. Okay? Say, so, yeah, that's kind of curious. By the way, I have no idea what else he did with his time, you know, <laughs> to find these kinds of things. But you look at this and you say, well, gee, that's curious. That could have been just accident of circumstance. Yes, except if you go to the book of Exodus, same thing happens. You go to the first Tau and count 49 letters. You come to a Vav. You count 49 letters. You come to a Resh. Count 49 letters. And you come to a He. The T-O-R-H equivalents, or Torah. Again, it's spelled with the same intervals. Well, you quickly come to the conclusion that can't be totally by chance, on the one hand. On the other hand, try sometime conducting a story, writing a story that will fit that kind of model. It ain't easy, okay? Try it sometime. But we're not through. If you try this on Leviticus, uh, it doesn't work. But if you go to Numbers, it does work if you spell Torah backwards. Now, why would somebody bother is one of your questions, right? But it, it works. It happens. You go to the first He, and you count 49 letters, you get to the Resh, you count 49 letters, you get to the Vav, and you get 49 letters, you get to the T. In other words, it's, it's as if you spelled Torah backwards. Okay? Again, 49 letter intervals. You go to the book of Deuteronomy, the same equivalent thing happens. We're dealing here with 49 letter intervals, which of course is 7 squared, 7 times 7. 49 letter intervals. Genesis goes forward, Exodus it goes forward, Numbers goes backwards, Deuteronomy goes backwards. Let's take a little closer look at Leviticus. 49 doesn't seem to work, but the, letter, the number 7 does. If you take intervals of 7, you get a yot, a he, a vav, and a he, which of course is the Yahweh, the unpronounceable, ineffable name of God. How interesting. That in itself is interesting. But let's put together what we know. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Exodus, we've got Torah spelled forwards. Exodus, we've got forward. Numbers, backwards. Deuteronomy, backwards. It seems that the Torah always points to the name of God. Do you see design here? Now, you've got two views about this. One view is that this is just the accident of circumstance. It's just a statistical oddity. There are Bible teachers that take that position. This is just statistics, an artifact of the Hebrew language. And by the way, there are some peculiar things about the Hebrew language that favors this kind of thing. There are books being written that try to point out all the reasons why this is an artifact of the Hebrew language. The Hebrew language has great density. There's only 22 letters. There's no vowels. It's designed to be very dense to make maximum use of the available bandwidth. My argument's the other way around. Maybe Hebrew lends itself to this in order to have the codes. Think about it. Let's move on. It's interesting that the Kabbalists and their textual traditions is what led to the cryptology that had its flowering in the Renaissance period. The Renaissance period developed the mechanical age of the cipher wheels and all the rest of it that led to Enigma, uh, the Enigma sh machines of World War II, which in turn led to the wartime computer development, which w led, interestingly enough, to the rediscovery of the codes. You see the loop close? I think that's interesting. The Torah codes, as they're called, really have their roots in Weissmandel, among others. A guy by the name of Daniel Michelson wrote the codes in the Torah, an article in the Or HaTorah, which is a journal, in 1987. About 1982, actually, a group of very, very bright, world-class mathematicians started looking at what Weissmandel discovered and start applying that using a computer and started to make some discoveries. And these were first mentioned in 1987 in Michelson's article. But the big thing came from Doran Whitsum and Elihu Rips and Johav Rosenberg when they wrote an article for that on equidistant letter sequences in the book of Genesis. Some years prior, they had published this in the Royal Statistical Journals in Britain. But what makes the Journal of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics so profound is it's a refereed journal. To get an article published there, it has to be reviewed by a group of peers. And there were 
eight guys that are all world-class mathematicians that spent six years studying their article and finally could not find fault with it, so it was published. Then this whole thing got even more visibility when uh, Dr. Jeffrey uh, Satinover wrote an article, Divine Authorship, which essentially summarizes in a more popular journal called the Bible Review in 1995. So the big furor really starts uh, publicly in the 94, 95, 96 time period. One of the things that they first discovered, uh, Whitsum and Rips discovered, they had a computer search the Torah for the name Israel. And they decided to take, um, they looked at the first 10,000 words or letters in the Torah, and they, looked for, they examined all possible intervals, looking for equidistant letter sequences, up to 100, both plus and minus, in other words, forward or backward. And what they found in the first 10,000 letters of Genesis, using that interval things, that the name Israel only appeared twice in Genesis, in the encryption sense, once at an interval of 7, and once at the interval of 50. Now you can make the argument that the thing could just show up by chance, but what disturbed them were those particular intervals were probably not accidental. They occur, they're clustered together in Genesis chapter 131 to roughly about the end of chapter 1 of Genesis. In the very passage that is their Kaddush, every Friday night over a glass of wine they say the Kaddush, it's based on this, it's related to the Sabbath. The 7, of course, speaks of the Sabbath, and so does the 50, because that speaks of the Jubilee year, the 7, 7, Weeks of years plus one, that makes the Jubilee year. So seven and fifty to a Jew speak of the Sabbath. And here is Israel mentioned in both of those intervals. That caught their attention. Is that coincidence? Coincidence? Theoretically. In Genesis chapter 2, there's a passage starting about verse 29 of chapter 1, ending about verse 9 of chapter 2. The passage opens with, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth. At every tree, in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, and to you it shall be for meat. It goes on. The passage sort of, this particular area closes then in verse 9 of chapter 2. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Okay? Hidden behind that text are the 25 trees that appear in the Old Testament. And here they're listed, the tamaris, the terebinth, the thicket, the citron, the acacia, and the intervals. The tamaris shows in intervals of only two apart. Debrinth, uh, minus two, in other words, the other direction. Uh, anyway, acacia, almond, wheat, date palm, cedar. Wheat, by the way, is also a term somehow associated with the knowledge of good and evil by some. Uh, cedar, the aloe, the uh, grape, the boxhorn, or bramble, acacia, pomegranate, gopher wood, thorn bush, or criticus. The olive, the pistachio nut, the hazel, the fig, the willow, the oak, the vine, the barley, the chestnut, and the poplar. The fact that these trees happen to show up in the Torah is not the point. Many people miss the point. You could argue that they show up to statistically. This, by the, any large body of text is bound to have what I, I call accidental encryptions hidden in it. That's not the point. Here are 25 trees clustered, first point, two issues, clustered in the same area and linked to the relevant plain text. If I treat the, the uh, scripture itself as the plain text, these are not irrelevant. These, these are the very clustered behind the very passage that deals with the trees. Follow me? So that catches your attention. Is this some big profound proof? No, but it, boy, it gets your attention. Let's move on. The Statistical Science article that by Doran Whitsum, Eliu Rips, and uh, Joav Rosenberg, they submit the research results. What they had done is there is a standard document that lists prominent rabbis in Israel. They took the 34 most prominent, prominence being defined by column inches in, the, in this critical biography. They took the 34 names of the rabbis, they took their dates of birth and death and had the computer search for them. The names of the rabbis and their date of birth and date of death were all found encrypted in the Torah. Blew them away. They submit their article for review to statistical science. The reviewers say, gee, that's still possible, kind of strange. What they ask is for 32 more, the next 32 most prominent. So they take those and their dates, birth and death, shoot them in. Every one of them is found. 
So they accepted the thing for publication after six years of analysis of all of this. Now there's some people that tried to run the same test, didn't get quite the right results because they did it sloppily. They didn't do it precisely well enough. There's other people, in fact, the head of the National Security Agency uh, got involved, as I recall. Dr. Helgans got involved. They submitted some additional ones, including this, the places of birth and death and so forth. They all, and they also put in a whole bunch of wrong dates. All that was screened out. Only the right stuff showed up, and, and they had even better results than the first time. It was estimated that the first 34 was like uh, one, one chance in 775 million that it could have been by accident. What they also find, as this goes on, are what are known as the Holocaust codes. In Deuteronomy 10, you find Hitler, Auschwitz, and the Holocaust. Deuteronomy 31, the Holocaust, crematorium for my sons. In Poland, you find plagues, the Fuhrer, Eichmann, king of the Nazis, genocide, Auschwitz, Germany, Hitler, Mein Kampf. There's the Hebrew intervals they're found, and there's the verses they're found in. Is that coincidence? Is that accidental? Some people argue that the, it is. Some skeptics, and by the way, there's some very bright, good guys that are skeptical of all of this. They took War and Peace in English and searched it and found the names of 13 people that had been assassinated. Itzhak Rabin, uh, Gandhi, uh, anyway, uh, 13 famous people. And they argue, not that there's anything special about War and Peace, is that in any large body of text, if you search hard enough, you can find names. But they missed the point. It's not just the names. It's the, it's the relevance to the past, the clustering, the relatives. Now, some big guns started to take a look at this. Dr. Harold Gans, first of all, you need to know something about the National Security Agency. That's probably, of the seven major ag uh, intelligence agencies in this country, the NSA is the largest. It used to stand, the initials used to stand for uh, no such agency. <laughs> Nowadays, it stands for uh, not secret anymore. Uh, in Fort Meade, Maryland. They were a customer of mine in a number of my previous roles. Dr. Harold Gans it was the senior mathematician for the National Security and the, and the resources of Fort Meade are staggering. They have more of the biggest and best of anything you can imagine in support of their mission. But he heard about all this and he decided to check it out for himself. So he programmed his own computer at home to analyze this his computations took 440 hours of running, 19 days straight. And when he saw the final result, he was staggered. He believes that there's less than one chance in 62,500 that this could have happened by chance. All eight referees and Dr. Gans have retired from their previous roles and are now teaching the Torah in synagogues around the world. So they're believers in the codes. Now... The exploitation begins. Michael Drosnan, who is not a believer, a self-confessed atheist, wrote a book called The Bible Code, which deals with all this background. In the book, he gives you the impression that he was a collaborator with Rips and uh, Whitsum, both of whom have denounced him. Uh, he's a name dropper and an exploiter. He claims in his book that, it, uh, that the Bible predicts uh, Itzhak Rabin's assassination. In the passage he uses in Deuteronomy 4, his translations are contrived. The mathematics is spurious. He's not a believer. This book has been attacked successfully, I believe, from both sides. People who are in favor of the codes attack him because he misses the whole point and he, his book, they feel, does more harm than good. The people who don't believe in the codes, if you write, pick up a book about, against the Bible codes, they're attacking Drawson's book. Not necessarily the codes, because that takes more mathematical sophistication than most people bring to the table. So the point is, the Bible code book that's making all the news is a straw man, easy to knock down from either side. It's fortunate in the sense it stirred up a lot of interest. It's unfortunate because it's generated a lot of misunderstandings. Now, Jeffrey Satinover is uh, much, he has a book called Cracking the Bible Code uh, that is uh, much more competent. Uh, it is, uh, he has a deep background in Judaism. And he also is a very sophisticated scientist. And his book is much more to the point, although he sees it all through what I would consider the blinders of Judaism and uh, of Talmudic Judaism. Uh, John Weldon has written a book, Decoding the Bible Code, Can We Trust the Message? John Weldon uh, writes some fabulous apologetic books, very competent guy. Uh, again, his book primarily is effective at uh, debunking Drosnan's book. He takes a number of statements that I would enjoy debating with him on the codes in general. 
The Jewish community in Israel discovers the codes, the articles go, and all the world is buzzing about the Torah codes, right? And a guy by the name of Yaakov Ramsel, a Messianic Jew in San Antonio, Texas, says, Hey guys, you're looking for names. How about the name Yeshua? You suppose it's there somewhere? And of course, it turns out that the name Yeshua is encrypted behind almost every Messianic prophecy in the Bible. Well, now this debate takes a three-way swing. There's the pro-codes, the anti-codes, but the Jews who are pro-codes are not too excited about the idea of Yeshua being in there. And uh, Ramsel is a neat guy, good friend. Uh, he's the guy that sends me a lot of stuff. That's where I got the acrostics for Esther and some of that stuff. And uh, Grant Jeffries and he uh, became good friends. And Grant Jeffrey published a book called The Signature of God in which he takes up the the support and the defense of the Bible codes. He also helps Yaakov Ramsel publish a book called Yeshua and a, subsequent, a sequel volume called Jesus is My Name. I'll come back to that. And Grant Jeffrey wrote not only The Signature of God, he's written a recent book called The Handwriting of God. And uh, both of us hope to have our books. He's doing another book, Proving the Codes Are Real. And I'll have, hope to have our book. Both of us are planning to make our books debut in the summer at the CBA and whatever. So we'll see what comes of that. Kind of interesting, Grant tells how when this all started, the Yeshua codes, he'd get a call from Israel, all upset. Well, Yeshua just means salvation. And Grant would say, now wait a minute. When you found Hitler, you recognize that as a name. He says, I understand your problem, but it's your problem. <laughs> now, you should understand... The rebuttal to Yeshua is that Yeshua consists of four letters, and two of them are the most frequent letters in the Hebrew alphabet. If you study Yeshua in the uh, Old Testament, not just the Torah, the Old Testament, in just looking at intervals of less than 100, it shows up over 5,538 times in the Old Testament. I've done this myself. And uh, 2,919 uh, going forward, and that includes 136 with no intervals. That is the name just spelled, Yeshua. And then 2619 going backwards. So it's very, very common. But I don't see that as a surprise. Jesus himself said, the volume of the book is written of me. I'm not surprised to find his name that frequently. He, Jesus challenges, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of what? Me. Yeah, there I am. Here is a list of the frequency tables in the Tanakh, the Old Testament. And uh, obviously the Vav and the, uh, the, the Yot and the Vav are the two most frequent letters and the He are the two most frequent letters uh, in the scripture. The cynics will say, well, this whole thing is just a statistical accident. Well, let's take a look at the Yeshua codes. Uh, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the creation encrypted as Yeshua is able. In Genesis 3, 27, Adam and Eve are covered, you know, by the coats of skins in chapter 3. You, behind that you have encrypted Yoshaya. He will save. Remember they put on aprons of fig leaves? But then God covered them with skins of animals, teaching them that by the shedding of innocent blood, they'd be covered. And behind that text, you've got encrypted Yeshaya. And he will save. Ruth, which the whole book communicates the kinsman redeemer, Boaz and all that. It opens with a five-interval sequence, Yeshua. Daniel 9, the 70 weeks, has a 26-letter interval encryption of Yeshua behind it. But that's just the starters, gang. You ready for this? Let's go to Isaiah 53. That was Yaakov Ramsdell's first discovery. But high, here's the high point of the Old Testament. Of all the passages in the Old Testament that deals with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, you've got Isaiah 53. Encrypted in that is Yeshua Shmi. Yeshua is my name. That's pretty impressive. Stand by. You have Yeshua is my name, his signature, Messiah, Nazarene, Galilee, Shiloh, Pharisee, Levites, both high priests, Caiaphas and Annas, Passover, the man Herod, wicked Caesar, perish. And that evil Roman city, let him be crucified, Moriah, cross, pierced from the atonement lamb, bread, wine, Obed, Jesse, David's line, of course, seed, water, Jonah, on it goes. Each of these having, you could preach a sermon about any one of these in its linkage to Isaiah 53. You say, that's pretty impressive? Stand by. Here's a list of the disciples. Disciples that mourn, Peter, Matthew, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, and two Jameses. Not one, two. There were two Jameses, right? Okay. And you've got Simon, Thaddeus, Matthias, three Marys, Salome, and Joseph. Now, it's interesting that one of these Marys 
and John and Yeshua are all linked together sharing the same yod. Remember where Jesus looks down at John and consigns Mary? It's interesting, interesting. Obviously all by statistical accident. <laughs> Forty names in 15 sentences encrypted. They're clustered, relevant. It's the clustering, it's not just the names, the clustering and the relevance that is the profound aspect of this. People say it's a statistical accident. I want you to examine this paragraph on the screen. There's something hidden in this paragraph, and I want to see if you can find it. The paragraph says, Upon this basis, I'm going to show you how a bunch of bright young folks did find a champion. A man with boys and girls of his own. A man of so dominating and happy an individuality that youth is drawn to him as is a fly to a sugar bowl. It is a story about a small town. It is not a gossipy yarn, nor is it a dry, monotonous account full of such customary fill-ins as romantic moonlight casting murky shadows down a long, winding country road. And it goes on. Here's a paragraph that has something about it that's weird. Something about this paragraph, if you examine it carefully, should bother you. There's a paragraph without a single E in it. There's not an E there. Now, the letter E is the most frequent letter in the English language. And that's what Samuel Morris, in making his Morse code, made the dot, the one dot, an E. It's the most frequent letter. It's the shortest thing. The whole Morse code was his attempt to make it frequency sensitive. The most frequent letters are the shortest. The least frequent are the longest in his Morse code. Well, E, E's occur in English about 13% of the time. You say, well, that's just a statistic. Okay, try writing a sentence without using an E. It ain't easy. Now, you could probably do it. He did it. In fact, he did more than that. The question you want to think about, what's the chance of that paragraph that you just read happening by accident? Pretty unlikely. In fact, what if I told you that paragraph came from a 267-page novel called Gatsby, A Story of 50,000 Words Without Using the Letter E. It was published in 1939 by Ernest Vincent Wright. And in order to pull this off, he could not use any past tense, no EDs. Couldn't use she, he, they, we, her. You start thinking about the words that he had to abandon. The list gets very onerous. He actually had to tie down the E of his typewriter to avoid it happening by accident. He could not use any number which, if spelled, had an E in it. It's a self-imposed task. He decided to try, and he did, and it's obviously just a literary curiosity. But it demonstrates something that trying to violate the basic statistical behavior of language is not easy. And those violations are a contradiction to chance. They're an evidence of effort. The absence of E in a full novel is phenomenal. The absence of E in a paragraph itself is something what you went home and tried to do, you would really have to work at it. It's not something that happens by accident. What's the chance of 40 people who are at the foot of the cross being encrypted behind the text of the crucifixion as prophesied in the book of Isaiah Eight centuries before Christ was born? Come on. Uh, David Cash, Dan, the chairman of the Department of Mathematics at Harvard, says the phenomenon is real. Of course, what it means is up to the individual. <laughs> I don't want to leave this subject, though, without touching on another aspect that is valid. In the interest of time here, I haven't given you a whole history of the Kabbalah or Pythagoras and the numer mystical brother, the secret brotherhood he formed in Italy that became uh, fashionable among the Greeks and the worship of numbers, not just discoveries of, of mathematics, but the worship of numbers is somehow something uh, very mystical. Many people ascribe the Pythagorean mysticism of the Greeks as infusing Judaism. And some of that's probably true. At the same time, the Kabbalists went long before, centuries before Judaism. We'll talk about some of that in our subsequent sessions. But there is a danger and getting involved in this kind of thing. There's a lure, if you will, of this. Now, there are some of the critics of the codes that I believe are very myopic. 
some very prominent authors who I really respect and I love their work have said some things that I regard as being a bit myopic. They say that there's no truth in God's word that the common man can't understand. I don't believe that's true. Jesus did say that God's truths are revealed to babes and hidden from the wise and prudent. He's talking about the gospel. He's talking about God's central truths, and I applaud that. That's absolutely true. But to go the other way around, I think, is a mistake. To presume that there's nothing in the scripture but what a common man can understand is to put God in a box that's naive and absurd. I don't think the Bible, I think anyone with an IQ of 50 can understand the gospel. But that doesn't mean everything in the Bible is limited to an IQ of 50. You follow what I'm saying? That's a funny way of saying it, perhaps, and I'm sure I'm going to get some nasty letters on that. Let me give you an example of what I mean. There was a guy by the name of Matthew Fontaine Maury. He read in the Psalms. There's a psalm there where there's pathways in the sea. He says pathways in the sea, and that became an obsession. So he became a midshipman, made his life study trying to find the pathways in the sea, ended up founding the whole field of oceanography. When you go to the Naval Academy, you, walk, you march from the uh, dormitory of Bancroft Hall down Stribling Walk to the main academic group. The head of it is Maury Hall, named after Matthew Fontaine Maury. He was in a position to get all kinds of ships, sailing ships all over the world to capture temperature data and current data, and he made maps of the ocean currents. He discovered the ocean currents and met much more. And the point is, all of this out of what? Out of his obsession with one verse in the Bible. And there are pathways in the seas. It's an interesting thing where it's the discovery follows the reference in the scripture. And there's dozens of these that are far more sophisticated that we'll be taking out lately. So to limit God is naive. I don't ever put God in a box. But clearly there is a misuse of the codes. And that's what Drosnan in effect is doing. He's trying to use these strange codes as a form of uh, fortune telling. Trying to make the Bible, the text of the Bible, a Ouija board. Which if you do the right things, you'll have it tell who's going to get killed when. And that's nonsense. One of the best spokesmen of this issue is Grant Jeffries. He pushes the codes hard. He does a good job defending them. But he always makes the point that the codes are not to predict the future. The codes are there so when the future happens, God is glorified. The codes in Isaiah 53 don't describe the details of the cross. But when you see the details of the cross and you go back, you can see... God's fingerprints all over the text from outside time. So there's a very subtle difference here between recognizing the fulfillment of prophecy and not using the Bible for divination. And divination in the Torah is prohibited. To do that in ancient Israel was a capital crime. You didn't get scolded, you got stoned. There's another side to this too, is close, a close cousin to this, and that's the lure of the occult. Somebody said, well, Chuck, you're getting into mysticism. Well, first of all, try finding an adequate definition of mysticism. It's not easy. Mysticism is defined as having a direct experience with God and trying to seek it outside God's word is the occult. But mysticism in and of itself, I don't apologize for. Why? Because Paul was a mystic. His highest dream was to be in Christ. Have Christ in you. John, the same thing. John and Paul are unabashedly Christian mystics. Not in the Gnostic sense, not in the heresy sense, hardly. But now there is an attempt at mysticism outside the plain teaching of God. And the divination thing is an example here are people using the Bible for divination when the Bible prohibits divination. Stop, guys. Think about it. And clearly, the Kabbalah, the term today, is used in a denotative way. The word Kabbalah today really refers to the occultic mysticism that grew up in Judaism. It had its flowering primarily in the 12th, 13th, 14th century. It was opposed to Talmudic Judaism in many ways. The word Kabbalah in the Talmud knows nothing of mysticism in the usual sense. They use it differently. But the Kabbalah, as you might hear the term today, refers to all these speculations, Jewish mystical speculations of the, uh, what they call the Geonic Era. And uh, uh, close akin to this is the area of Gematria. 
The Hebrew alphabet and the Greek alphabet were unique in that each letter had a numerical value. And that has all kinds of implications, and we will have some real surprises for you the next time we meet on this subject. Because Gamatria is disparaged by most Bible scholars, but much to everyone's shock, there is some interesting Gamatria in the Scripture. In 1 Kings 7.23, there is a mathematical formula for pi that has been overlooked for centuries. Also, everybody that talks about, all the scholars say, well, there's no Gamatria in the Bible, Except, of course, for Revelation 13, 18, the 666. Is that gamma tree or not? Well, that's a whole other subject for another night. But the Gnost- in the early church, the Gnostic heresies were all hung up with mysticism and, and this sort of thing. So be on your guard. There is a dark side of the coin.